Welcome, 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 everybody, to another Bears win edition of the Charter Podcast brought to you by St. Xavier University. My name is Alex Shapiro. With me, my partner in crime, Kevin Lapka and Edgar Perez. We got a lot to talk about, but first, we got to introduce the new cast, the new character in this cast, I should say, and that is Kevin Lapka. Kevin, what up? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, you know, join CHSN Digital Content Production with these great folks right here, Alex and Edgar. And there's no place I'd rather be, guys, than right here, right now, after a Bears win. And we're lucky because my first time here on the Charter Podcast, we're breaking down a glorious 35-16 win. I would have been so upset if we had to come on here after a crushing <laughs> loss, waking up early and having to break this down after a loss. But we're here after a win. Good to be here with you guys. Yeah, hell yeah. And uh, I'm just putting it out there. In the CHSN history of the Bears podcast, Bears are undefeated. So uh, you are That's welcome, Bears Nation. Undefeated. Um, okay, so again, we've got a lot to talk about on offense. we got a lot to talk about on defense. But as always, we are starting with the quarterback, Caleb Williams. I mean, once again, Caleb was just on fire by my count. Like one mistake, maybe. The mm-hmm. interception when he was targeting DJ Moore didn't get enough mustard on it. Other than that, so good. (laughs) Really, really good. 23 of 29. That's a 79% completion rate. That's good for 226 yards. Four touchdowns, just the one interception. And uh, he added some some great production on the ground, too. Four rushes for 56 yards, a few really, really good scrambles. So, Kevin, let's kick it off with you. You are a new guy on the show. What would you like about Caleb Williams' game today? Man, I mean, let's just take it. Let's let's take a season overview look at it, right? And and just the linear ascension of his play week over week. That to me is the storyline, right? Because there were a couple of weeks where there was concerns, and you know, is this going to work with Waldron? What's the problem here? How are we going to fix it? Relax, everything's going to be okay. And then boom, positive progression here in the last couple of weeks leading up to this week. His best game, in my opinion, by far as a Chicago Bear at every level. The accuracy on point. There were some issues with that earlier in the year, and we all really weren't that concerned about it because that was never really too big of a problem in college. But it's the little things, right? The little things that we haven't seen from Bears quarterbacks in the entire tenure of the Chicago Bears is the quick decision making, reading the field, his eyes moving so quick, especially on that Keenan Allen touchdown. And then there you go, a keyhole throw right there at the to high point the football for Keenan Allen to get in the end zone. Just the right decisions rushing the ball as well, an element of his game. We haven't seen that much earlier in the year. He added that a lot today, which we've been waiting for because you want to talk about him being a little Mahomey and looking like Mahomes and and being having that element of his game that's going to make him, you know, one of the upper echelon guys in the league. That's that dynamic playmaking ability that we saw today. So honestly, I'm just looking at it from a whole season standpoint, this linear ascension and him reaching every new week a new level of play for him to me is just beyond impressive and shows growth for him. Edgar. Yeah. I, th- I think you, you, you nailed everything, um, Kevin. And he, he's, he's been playing great. The linear progression, like you said, um, this is what stands out with Caleb, right? Like we, we talked about uh, just being able to, to see the game progress to him in his eyes and how he plays. Uh, we wanted to see it continue with, with the game today. And we saw that he, he, he hit the throws. We saw the different throws. He, he, um, that can he has in his arsenal, right? We saw some nice back shoulder throws. The the throw to Keenan Allen, the first touchdown, it was just a missile to Keenan's back shoulder, and he adjusted it. The nice touch on the fade to Keenan Allen, also in the second touchdown pass. Like you said, uh, Alex, the one mistake was that little like floater. He put a little too much air on it to to uh, DJ Moore, but that's just one out of a, of a near perfect day it seemed he had, right? Uh, another efficient game, like you said, twenty three out of twenty nine through the air. It only 226, and but it feel it feels like more. Like when when I feel like when a quarterback is this efficient and he's he's getting the ball out, he's throwing downfield. I feel like I was watching him throw for 350 or something. But you go down, you, you check the box score, and you're like, oh, he's he's just he's just nailing his guys like down the field. And it's it was a great performance, and you 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 love to see it. I wanted to see this part of his game evolve. And I know we have a small sample size with his career at the moment. But it's exciting because he is a rookie, right? Because we are seeing these strides game after game. His throws are developing. And, it, it, I mean, it's, 
I hate to get this excited this early, but I mean, I have no choice. What well, back to back games? You can get excited, Edgar. It's okay, bro. <laughs> I don't. I am. I am excited, but like I, I want to temper my own excitement for my own good. But it's 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 easy to see the talent, and it, it keeps only only keeps getting better and better. And you hope he continues this kind of progression as we hit the tougher part of the schedule. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people will say, "Oh, well, the Panthers' pass defense is no good, and the Jaguars' pass defense is no good." But you can't who help who you're playing. You're supposed to dominate those right. teams. You're supposed to carve those teams up. And that's exactly what the Bears passing offense did. And how many times has the storyline been, oh, this defense's run defense is no good, or this defense's pass defense is no good, but then all of a sudden they look like superstars and they use the Bears as a get-right game. You, you yeah. know? <laughs> it, it, let's look at the other side of the coin. The, the Jaguars are probably looking at the Bears' run defense and saying, oh, the Bears' run defense has been struggling. This is going to be a great get-right game for us. But no, the Bears, it was a get-right game for the Bears' rush defense, right? So... So the Bears did what they were supposed to do against a bad defense, and that's and that's carve them up. I do want to highlight those touchdown throws in particular because I think every single one of those touchdown throws was special. Let's start with the first one, Cole Komet. It's the double fake. It was a fake mm. with, uh, I forget, I believe it was Roma Dunze or Keenan Allen with the motion. Yeah, so there's a little mm. bit of eye candy, and then they fake the screen. That is some incredible poise by Caleb Williams to hang in there because he's got a dude bearing down on him and he is just cool calm collected makes the fake and then finds Colcomet for a layup down the seam Colcomet finishes the job great strength second touchdown uh it's a it's a coverage breakdown the Jags have a coverage breakdown Caleb Williams again makes the layup he makes the easy throw look easy it's what you're supposed to do and then the two touchdown throws to Keenan Allen are in my opinion really special the the first one Edgar Perez you nailed it back shoulder throw puts it where only he can get it perfect pass touchdown the second one Keenan Allen after the game actually said and this is even more impressive yes it was a perfect throw it's an absolutely perfect throw I don't think Caleb Williams could have walked over and dropped it into his hands any better than the way he threw that ball (laughs) but when you realize it was actually a check that was supposed to be a run play and uh, Keenan Allen had one-on-one in man coverage and the check is supposed to be, Hey, don't run the ball, throw the ball to your guy. One-on-one on man coverage. And, and Keenan Allen's like, please recognize it. This has to be a throw to me. Caleb Williams recognizes it. Doesn't hand the ball off, gives it to Keenan Allen. One-on-one in man coverage again, touchdown. That's high level quarterback play. That's really high level quarterback play. And it, okay. It wasn't perfect. Right. There we talked about the interception. There were a few moments where the operation wasn't wasn't ideal, right? They have the illegal shift, and that's something where okay, does Caleb Williams need to recognize I got to let my guy get set, or is that an error on somebody else? Buck stops at the QB, and then there was another one where they were late getting out of the huddle, late getting the line. They have to burn a timeout in the in the first half. This is nitpicky stuff. These are nitpicky yeah. minuses on the sheet. Otherwise, Caleb Williams had truly a, a, a nearly a nearly perfect performance. He was really, really good. Uh, but wasn't all just him. We also got a highlight Cole Komet. I mean, this dude did everything. Uh, he had the breakout game with the two touchdowns. He obviously trucked the dude from the end zone. And yeah, by the way, he's long snapping too. Edgar Perez, uh, <laughs> take us through Cole Komet's day. Hey, Cole Komet was awesome. I mean, I mean, no, uh, I think Flus Express in uh, one of the post game interviews, not the press or official press. I think I heard this on the radio where, there was a little hesitance to have him actually long snap for for field goals. So keeping those those little short ones or for punts, I should say, that's what kind of led to a few of those uh, fourth down. Um, they were them going for fourth down, even though they had such a lead. He was to prepare uh, and kind of concentrate. He didn't even know he was going into the game. They they told him that that Scott got hurt, and he was thinking Tyler Scott got hurt. Like, what does that have to do <laughs> with me? And so he got into the game, and he still was able to to concentrate and perform and. Five for five for what was it, 70 yards and two touchdowns. And him being able to just truck the guy in the middle of the field, he just had a, a just in the, just as just as an efficient day with Caleb Williams. Kevin, uh let, let's uh well do, do you have Cole Komet thoughts? 
Well, yeah. I mean, we got to give some credit to Clay Harbor on the big pro football show. He was all <laughs> over this all week, talking about the ineptitude of the Jaguars' defense and how there's a lot available in the middle of the field. And obviously, they score that first touchdown right up the seam on that double fake screenplay. Um, and they find him in the end zone there. But I, I had to shout out my guy, Clay, because he was the one mm -hmm. putting it out there. We know our guy, Mike Bowling, did his little bet thing. He had uh, Cole Komet 25 plus yards. Um, but yes, yeah, just a really efficient day. I want to I want to share one thing about Caleb Williams real quick before I move on on this. That too, I thought was really important. Um, after that interception, right? And we, we know the Bears had a sluggish start to the game in general. And everyone's yeah. like, oh no, the jet lag, the whole London narrative, right? But Caleb Williams in his first couple games in an NFL career, specifically against Houston and against Indianapolis, did not rebound as well as you probably would want to after mistakes, after turnovers, right? And then there's images going around the internet of him on the sideline with his, you know, back on the bench, like, oh, you know, uh, you know, pouting or whatever, not pouting, but we wanted to see him be able to make a mistake, which is totally okay. It happens in the NFL, right? It's going to happen for the duration of his career. How do you respond? How do you rebound, especially in an adverse situation like playing overseas in London with the start that they had to this game? And he did a phenomenal job on the next drive, working that efficiency down the field and then getting uh, the touch on Nicole Komet. So I just want to throw that in there about how the Bears offense, not just Kid Williams um, and Shane Waldron, rebounded after that mistake. But yes, huge day for Cole Komet, one of the MVPs of the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we got to keep it going. I mean, we just got to keep out handing out flowers. When the Bears win <laughs> by three scores, it's just flowers, flowers, flowers all across the field. Uh, and my next rose goes to DeAndre Swift. 17 carries, 91 yards, and a touchdown, four targets, four receptions, 28 receiving yards. This is the dude that the Bears thought they were getting when they signed him to that big free agent deal. Uh, it, it took a while, but now we're starting to see it consistently. And he's impacting the game in the screen game. He's impacting the game in the run game. The thing that impressed me the most with DeAndre Swift is his ability to get north-south, just hit the hole with burst and go and pick up yards, mm -hmm. and his ability to stay patient on the edges let blocks develop in front of him. And then once they've developed, make the one cutback that he needs to make, find the space and go. So he is doing it pretty much all three ways. You think of some wide receivers at, or some running backs rather as, you know, like, okay, I'm a good outside zone guy. I'll find the hole and I'll use my craftiness, shiftiness to, to get going forward. Or I'm a North South guy and I'm just going to hit the hole hard with bursts and I'm going to move forward or I'm a receiving guy. He's doing all three. Um, so, yeah. so Deandre Swift also phenomenal. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to kick back to you. Anybody else that you would like to, to talk about here? No, I mean, DeAndre Swift deserves a lot of credit, especially after the first three weeks. And people were wondering, do, do they make a change at RB1? Is Roshan Johnson deserving of a majority of the carries? Where's Khalil Herbert, right? And that's still a question that remains to be answered. You know, it doesn't seem to matter. They're scoring points. You know, it's the first time they've scored 30 or five offensive touchdowns in back-to-back -back games since, I believe, 1956. Uh, so that yeah. has been a long time. Um, so the offense is clicking. And yes, with DeAndre Swift, I mean, would you guys say he's probably the most explosive playmaker on the offense, right? I mean, he has to be. And in terms of like home run ability, you're probably yeah. right. Yeah, I would agree. There, yeah. DJ Moore is is a home run yes. guy, but I mean, DeAndre Swift has that extra burst. I think that's a good call. Yeah, extra burst, and they're using him in that way. And they don't have a ton of other like really explosive playmakers. Like we know, Keenan Allen's one of the most solid route runners, uh, efficient guys in the NFL. We have yet to see what Roma Dunze really provides from there. Um, but DeAndre Swift being that explosive guy. But I'll throw that shout out real quick, Alex, to the Bears' offensive line, especially for the way that they have picked it up. We know Nate Davis, a healthy scratch today. Guys are filling in. Matt Pryor does a great job. Coleman Shelton, Tevin Jenkins, all those guys, Braxton Jones, Darnell Wright, really held it down against Joshua Hines Allen, still one of the better pass rushers in the NFL there on the defensive side of the ball for the Jaguars. I thought they did a great job. Obviously, here and there, a couple plays where there's a pocket breakdown. But in general, when you're that efficient on offense, I mean, kudos to the offensive line and for picking things up. And kudos to Matt Eberflus, Chris Morgan, and Shane Waldron for figuring this thing out after a couple of weeks when there were seemingly no answers. There were seemingly yeah. no answers. You weren't going to get a new player. You were, you know, the draft's not till April. The trade deadline's not for a couple more weeks, <laughs> right? How do you fix this? They have found a way. Let's see if they can continue and going forward. EP? Yeah, I think you 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 really gave credit to the offensive line, which I think they did a phenomenal job today. They followed up the great performance like they did with, with the, against the Panthers. 
And credit to Shane Waldron. I know bowling last episode in the last uh, reaction to video, he he really gave his flowers to Shane Waldron. Him designing those plays, like we said, the Cole Komet play, it was just a thing of beauty. I mean, this offense is humming. And to to your, I know DeAndre Swift was my player of the game last year. I mean, last week. But I think we're we might be starting to see how important he is to this offense. I mean, if he doesn't have the game, he does. I mean, more pressure is put on Caleb and. When, whenever uh, that kind of pressure is put on a rookie, and we, we saw it earlier when him having that game, when he threw the ball 52 times or whatever it was. He's, if that if that offense wants to be on a roll, I think getting DeAndre Swift involved and getting the, the ball to him in just a variety of ways is really important to not only Caleb, just to just for the flow of the game. And we'll talk about more about the flow of the game because I did mark that down, uh, something I might do want them to focus on the on, in the bye week here. But DeAndre Swift is impacting this team, like you said, how how they expect it to. And credit to him for 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 for, for sticking to it for after you know all the criticism, like you said, in the first couple of weeks. This guy might be. I know Caleb Williams is the, the, the number one piece, right, on on this offense. But maybe a one A a one B might be DeAndre Swift mm-hmm. with with this with the way he's been playing. I agree. I think if you took an anonymous poll of the offensive coaching staff at Hallis Hall, I bet most guys would say. The Bears want Caleb Williams to throw the ball under 30 times compared to throw the ball over 40, 45 times. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to need to lean on DeAndre Swift. When DeAndre Swift has an inefficient day like he has recently, it just makes everything so much easier for everybody else. Uh, I want to give a little bit more love to Keenan Allen, who it's been a slow start for him. He hasn't gotten the ball probably as much as he expected, as others expected. Uh, He even said coming into this game, he didn't think he was going to get that many targets in this game. Uh, The two touchdowns are obviously eye-popping. We talked about the two touchdowns. But the four catches on only four targets is maybe low. But it's the when the the targets are happening. Mm -hmm. He has the two touchdowns in the red zone. His third catch is a third down conversion to move the chains. And his fourth catch is a fourth down conversion that essentially ices the game, right? Mm -hmm. So situationally, even though he's not getting 10 targets a game, he's getting those targets in high leverage moments. And today he and Caleb Williams were able to make it happen. To me, that is more important than the volume. It's the situation. That's what the bears brought him in to do, to be, security blanket to be a sure-handed guy in big time moments and he came through uh so so good on keenan allen dude you're nailing that too because i think there was a lot of people early in the season obviously dealt with the injury but i think people were questioning the value of the trade right like all right if you're gonna trade a fourth round pick for a guy who is typically has a super high volume of targets and did in los angeles uh why are you not throwing him the ball more what's the value what are you getting out of him And then you kind of think you described it perfectly, Alex. You have a rookie quarterback who needs support in those exact situations on third down, on fourth down. Can you just give us a player who gets open no matter the circumstance? And that is literally what Keenan Allen has done this year. And that is what he has done his entire career. So I think when you talk about value and you kind of go and reevaluate trades, we love to reevaluate trades, right? And did, did who won the trade, right? We're going to, who won the trade? And there's not a clear winner, I think, in this one, but you know, you're the value you're getting out of Ken Allen and you're starting to see it in the bigger moments. And you will, as these games get more important, as you pay better defenses, if the playoffs were in, you know, in, in view in December and January, that's a player that they're going to rely on and probably well worth that fourth round pick. So hundred percent, Alex. Love it. Any other thoughts on the offense before we, uh, we look at the defense. All right. So for me. Defensive time for a 12th straight game. The Bears defense has held an opponent under 21 points. That is the longest streak in the NFL. It's the longest Bears streak since they did it in 2005, 2006, which was another very good season for the Bears. Uh, And I want to start by talking about a couple guys in relief roles. Uh, Josh Blackwell comes in for an injured Kyler Gordon, comes up with a big pick. Elijah Hicks comes in for an injured Jaquan Brisker has a couple of key PBUs. He has a fumble recovery. He had some other solid plays. Uh, And then Jalen Jones got challenged a little bit early, but he settled in and had a pretty good game. Uh, Let's start with Edgar this time. Edgar, just your general thoughts about the defense today. 
I think they played a great game. Um, after that first drive that uh, the Jaguars got off to, the, they held the ball for what, what was it, like eight minutes, I believe. Um, and like you said, they went after uh, Jalen Jones there. I thought we were going to be in for a, a bit of a shootout still after seeing that, but that might just be the the, the, the way this Bears team, like maybe they're just not, not getting off to such a hot start, kind of like the offense, actually, now that I think about it. Um, they gave it that, that, that long drive. Luckily, it, was, it wasn't a touchdown. Gabe Davis kind of flubbed the ball there. He kind of dropped it. I know they came over and uh, they got a hit on him, but that's a ball he should have he had for seven. Um, but after that, the defense settled in, and, and, and they, they really were able to, to get to, um, to Trevor Lawrence, maybe not with the sack numbers, but they were still getting, getting them pressure. And like you said, they kind of held their ground on the ground. So them being able to step up with the injuries and being the credit to the subs that came in, to really just perform where they needed to and step up where they needed to. Because, I mean, when you lose guys in your secondary like that, you expect them to, to really target them. And they did to start off. But credit to them for stepping up and, and really just holding their ground for this defense. Laka? I just I, – I truly think this is unbelievable that they have gone 12 games, 12 games, allowing less than 21 points. We Do we know what the NFL record is? Because it has to be in sight. I mean, I was just doing some quick digging, and I can't find it. We'll, we'll try to find it here at some point. But, I mean, this is just a in very impressive defense at every level. And we talk about Matt Eberflew's strengths as a coach. Obviously, it comes on the defensive side of the ball. And you see that firsthand when you see guys come in – in replacement and immediate make plays and immediately do all the things that Matt Eberflus wants them to do, right? The hits principle and get takeaways and all that. And they do just that, right? I, I was so confused when I woke up this morning, guys, and I opened up my phone and it said bears plus one and a half. And the bears were underdogs in the game and the line moved. The line, the line moved, moved all the way to the Bears yeah, being the dogs. The dogs. It, yep. it, it, they were dogs. I couldn't believe it. I was like, all right, I've been asleep for like five hours. Like, what happened? Did, did the, the Was there a crash <laughs> with the team bus on the way to the stadium? What's happening here? Um, and I think, right, the sports books and, and all these sharp, you know, money people were putting a lot of stock in the fact that they were without Jaquan Brisker, who could be a pro bowler this year, without Tyreek Stevenson, who we know is a very high-level cornerback, and the Jaguars have decent receiving threats. And it ended up not mattering. It just it, it and, and that's not anything against Stevenson or Brisker. It's just that those guys came in and did exactly what they needed to do and were prepared for the moment. And that is a testament to Matt Eberflus and Eric Washington, the defensive coordinator, getting their guys ready to play and being ready for these moments when they're going to be asked to come in the game. Um, and they did just that. And yeah, it's just, I mean, I got to believe it's a top five defense in the NFL right now. And I truly do believe they have a ceiling of top three, if not the best defense in football right now. And that's reflected by stats and that's reflected by when you watch the games, the only criticism I would have of the defense the entire year is they struggle a little, I, not struggle, but they're more susceptible to allowing points in the beginning of the game, right? The Bears have been down at first in their first six games. Every single game, they have they have not had a lead to start the game, um, but they figure it out after that first drive and all is good and great. Impressive job by the defense today. Matt Eberflew says it all the time. You cannot have enough corning back, cornerbacks. That was on full display today. I mean, the Bears were down to CB4 and uh, slot corner two and safety three, uh, and they uh, they figured it out. Uh, but it was also good pass rush, four sacks. You know, quietly, the guys racked up four sacks, and I know a few of them came at the end of the game when the Jags were in pass, pass, pass mode. Mm -hmm. uh, Montez Sweat, I think he was only credited with a half a sack, but I think he's going to have two half sacks. That might change. It looked like he was in on two. Uh, so pass rush was looking good. Is there any other guy you guys want to, want to point out who, who maybe we haven't talked about on defense? Lapke, you're yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy went out for the game with a hamstring injury and, you know, dealing, dealing with that. We'll see what goes on. Luckily the bears do have the bye coming up. Got two weeks for a lot of guys to get healthy. Kyler Gordon, Jaquan Brisker, Stevenson, all that. Uh, but before he went out of the game, Kyler Gordon was phenomenal. He was the best player on defense before he went out. I mean, he was all over the field making plays and it just the way they move him around, what they ask him to do. He's blitzing all the time. He's making open field tackles. He's in coverage in the slot. I mean, he is their jack of all trades. He's their Spider-Man, obviously, uh, as they call him. That's his nickname. And he's just a phenomenal player. He's just an extremely quality player who does everything the right way and makes big plays in the biggest moments. Anytime it's one-on-one -on -one with Kyler Gordon with an open field tackle, like I can't remember the last time he hasn't made that play 
Like he is just always there in the backfield, so quick to the ball. Kyler Gordon was absolutely balling. Unfortunate that he had to go out with the hamstring, and hopefully he'll be back for that huge tilt against the Commanders week eight. Uh, but yeah, Kyler Gordon, underrated star of the game on defense. Edgar? Love me some Kyler Gordon. <laughs> I already expressed my, my thoughts on Kyler Gordon in the episodes past, but I agree with Kevin. Mate. It's, he's When that guy is on the field, he's making plays. He's a baller. He's flying around. Yeah. Um, overall, defense was great. We already gave our flowers to the guys that came in in substitution. We just hope that the rest of this defense can heal up. It's a perfect time for the bye week. I know it's some may think it's a little bit early, but for the Bears in their current situation, the bye week is a perfect time to get healthy right now. I tweeted out partway through the game that it felt like Kyler Gordon had five TFLs already. Um, he only had one TFL in actuality. <laughs> but I mean, there were tons of tackles, as you guys said, right around the line of scrimmage. Even though he left the game early, he finished tied for second on the team with seven stops. Jalen Jones led the team with 10. Like, typically, you don't want the cornerback to have the most tackles. But, you know, he did a good job of keeping guys in front of him. And even if he was giving up catches, he wasn't giving up huge, explosive plays. The Bears really never got gashed, gashed. I mean, obviously, there were moments, and the Bears, you know, gave up a score. And, you know, just like anything, you know, the Jaguars players are getting paid, too, and they made some plays. But for the most part, the Bears did a really, really good job of keeping the ball in front of them. Uh, and that included Jalen Jones and Kyler Gordon. Uh, just quick injury updates. We talked about the Kyler Gordon hammy. Uh, there is no update on that. And then Scott Daly, he left the game with a knee injury, and it was one of those like instant outs. And typically knee injury coupled with instant out is a bad sign. Uh, so hope hopefully Scott Daly is healthy soon. Nobody likes to get anybody. Uh, nobody likes to see anybody get hurt. Cole Komet did an excellent job as the emergency sub. It will be very interesting to see what the Bears do at long snapper moving forward. We have not had an update on Patrick Scales in some time. Patrick Scales has not been designated to return from IR. Uh, he's been gone since since the summer. Uh, and then, who was the guy? I looked up his name and I already forgot it. Not Carson Daly. The, the, the long snapper that the Bears had in training Daly? camp. No, Scott Daly is the guy oh. who they replaced him with. Oh, but sorry, yeah. The Bears, the Bears had a long snapper throughout training camp, and he wasn't getting the job done. That's why the Bears went with Scott Daly. Scott Daly was on the Lions practice squad throughout the entire summer, and then when the Lions cut him, they were like, oh, uh, the Bears were like, oh, let, let's scoop this guy up. <laughs> the guy we got isn't getting it done, so we're going to make this switch right before the regular season to Scott Daly. So it will be interesting to see if the Bears bring back the guy. I'll look up his name. Bears cut. Long snapper. Let's see who it was. Cameron Lyons. Apologies to Cam Lyons. I forgot your name. Carson. I said Carson. It was Cameron. Uh, oh, so Cam Lyons. The Bears cut Cameron <laughs> Lyons over the over the summer. Uh, we'll see if they bring him back or if they, since they already kind of moved on from him once, will they look somewhere else? It'll be interesting to see what the Bears can do at long snapper. Uh, with that, let's go around the horn and pick our players of the game. Time to hand out game balls. Kevin Lapka, who's who's your player of the game today? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be Cole Komet, right, for me. I mean, that's just, it's a no-brainer. The guy's playing two positions. And it was actually interesting. I mean, they were talking about uh, that in post game, And Caleb was like, I mean, those one points could have been important at the time. That, that, that extra point could have been important at the time. And it was just cool to see him, like, give him kudos. So, like, I know they won the game by 19 and ended up not mattering, but... That's an important role, you know, to be the long snapper, to have an efficient uh, extra point go through. Uh, and then obviously the two touchdowns just was uh, phenomenal. So Cole Komet, to me, the easy, obvious answer. You, you gave me the layup with that one. So uh, Cole Komet, hell of a job on Sunday. Edgar, you might have another layup. There's a lot of layups in this game. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alex, I'll, I think I'll leave, I'll leave you one other one of the layups, but I'll take the same guy I took last week, DeAndre Swift. I know, I know. I'm – Maybe I just don't want to go with the obvious QB game here, but I I, I said it before, earlier. I'll say it again. He I think he's a major part of this offense. Getting him going in the game is super important. You know, we 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 gave the stats earlier: seventeen carries for ninety-one rushing yards, uh, one hundred and nineteen total yards of offense. 
this guy's getting it done, and he's a major part that allows this defense to kind of spread out, to kind of to kind of ease the pressure off of Caleb. He's playing his role in the receiving game. He's running the ball really well. Game ball again to DeAndre Swift on my end. I can't believe two weeks in a row <laughs> Caleb Williams is is not getting selected for a game ball until me when I go third. The quarterback was nearly perfect. We talked about the very few amount of miscues that he had. Other than that, I mean, he was spreading the ball around. He was incredibly accurate. When the protection was good up front, and we we should give the offensive line credit. They struggled early, but he had good protection a lot of the time. And when the protection was good, he was in rhythm. One, two, three, the ball is out. If it's not there, he's fine the check down. I mean, just working in the rhythm of the offense, no problem. When there was pressure, and there was pressure sometimes, he was able to escape for the most part. Yep. And reel off some incredible scrambles, either extending the play and then finding a guy downfield like that one scramble. And then he throws across his body to Cole Komet. <laughs> Ridiculous play or escaping the pressure and then running for 20 yards. Woof. Caleb Williams had a, a remarkable day today. We got to give an honorary mention last week. I was like, ah, we probably should have given the guy an honorary mention. I want to give an honorary mention to Elijah Hicks. Going into the game, we previewed him as one of the most improved players on the Bears uh, in terms of his second year and where he was at to where he is this year. He came in. He had some huge PBUs. He was Johnny on the spot for the fumble recovery. Elijah Hicks, next man up, got the job done. So honorary game ball, honorary mention to Elijah Hicks as well. Before we turn the page to the bye week, do any of y'all have any final thoughts on this game? I mean, nah. I just, I would say that just this iteration of the Chicago Bears looks like a legit playoff threat in the NFC. Am I wrong about that? Like, am I reaching oh. too far? Because I don't want to be that guy who's doing it in week six. <laughs> but, but this iteration of the Bears with how good their defense is and how efficient their offense can be, especially with DeAndre Swift moving the ball like this. And let's, let's, let's preface this. There's going to be a lot of people who are saying, well, the past three weeks, he plays three of the worst pass defenses in the NFL. This is true. We are acknowledging that. And they will have bigger tests, and the offense will not look this good every week. That will not happen. But they've gotten the job done against bad teams, against bad defenses. And we've had years before where they've had good offenses and they haven't had the job. They haven't gotten the job done against bad teams, right? And that, that's what good teams do when you have uh, the advantage against your opponent, especially offense versus defense. You, you go out there and you take advantage of it. So I just, that's my really, my takeaway is like, okay, they did things the right way. They left early. They left on Monday, right? Organizationally, it felt like a, a smart, clean operation the entire way for something that's as adverse as going to London. They go out, they win the game handedly, yes, against a team that's not one in five. But this iteration for me, in my eyes, of the Chicago Bears is a playoff team in the NFC. Tiger? I think Kevin captured everything that our thoughts are with this with this, with this this Bears team at the moment. They're, they're taking care of business. They're beating who they have to beat. They're improving week to week. The bye week's coming up. Let's get healthy. A, a run of the of uh, tough games is, is, is coming up. So you want to get them. You want to see them get into rhythm here. But overall, these past few weeks have been just the the, the way they got to these last two weeks compared to the start of the season. It's just been amazing to see. I want to shout out one thing that I think could have been a turning point in this game, and that was the three minute offense that the Bears ran at the end of the first half. This is an area where the Bears actually struggled a lot in the past. In the fourth quarters, they were not good. And in two-minute drills, they were not good. And that was an area that in this offseason, the Bears identified as something we need to get better at. So the Bears get the ball with three minutes left in that first half. And what do they do? They have an extremely efficient 10-play, 85-yard drive. It eats up almost all of the clock. It, it it involved good running. It involved some solid passes and it involved those Caleb Williams scrambles. It was everything. The bears cap it off with a touchdown with almost no time left on the clock for the Jaguars to respond. That made the score 14 to three heading into half, knowing that the Jaguars were going to get the ball out of half. That's a big moment because you know, 10 to three. Okay. We got points. We feel good. Seven to three, the Jaguars getting the ball out of half. It's like, Whoa. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can get a stop and then go from there. But 14 to three, eating up all of that clock. That's a that's a big moment. And really, the, the Bears never took their foot off the gas after that, in my opinion. 
they really capitalize on that momentum going forward. Uh, and then there was one more thing that actually just popped in my head. Bears, two takeaways turned into two touchdowns, 14 points off the takeaways. I mean, this is this is it. This is the Bears following their script. This is the Bears following their script to win football games. Kevin, you mentioned it. it's a one in five team, but you got to you have to do these <laughs> things. You have to execute. You have to execute yep. against the one in five teams, and and uh, and they did that. So hats off to the Bears in those in those ways. Uh, bye week is coming up. Edgar Perez, what's your one focus for the Bears heading into the bye week? Uh, I hope they work on getting off to a better start. Uh, I know they a little, there was a little bit of talk of this from Caleb uh, at his at his presser, but it's something that we saw. I mean, they got it was back to back three and outs this week. Last week against the the Panthers, he had a quick three and out to start the game. And I know eventually it's hard to say that when they're putting up thirty something points at the end of the day, but that's something with these tough defenses, you might not be able to 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 put up those kind of points on on, on tougher defenses. So getting off to a better start, at least. Being able to, to to get a first down to, to 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 extend their possessions to start the game, I think it's very important. Uh, we've given uh, credit to Shane Waldron uh, to how this uh, offense has kind of evolved, but there was that story earlier that he wasn't scripting first fifteen plays, which is kind of nuts. Um, and that might be the 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 thing that's that's playing into this um, to the reason they're getting out to kind of slow starts too. So you kind of hope they kind of dial that in. Not as many three and outs to start the game, like I said. Uh, if they're able to 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 get out to better starts, that'll help when they play um, tougher defenses, um, because it's something that they're gonna need to take advantage of, right? Uh, not they're not gonna come out and score 36, 38 points every single game. So uh, I think getting out to a better start is important for this team. It's something they should work on. Lapka, what do you think the Bears should focus on in the bye week? That's exactly what I had written down as well, right? I mentioned it before in all six games, they have gone down first, right? And again, you've had the luxury of playing the Panthers. You've had the luxury of playing the Jaguars. But when the Detroit Lions come to town, uh, Green Bay team that still, you know, is very threatening. And of course, the Vikings uh, undefeated at this moment in the NFC North, right? When those when, when you play those opponents some better teams, um, you might not be able to afford not getting any points in the fourth quarter, not being efficient and, and struggling on defense in those first couple of drives. And, you know, again, it's been extremely impressive the way that they picked it up after that. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's really like after watching the game today, that's really the only glaring flaw of the game. After those two drives, everything was seamless. They did everything you wanted uh, on defense. They were efficient on offense. So, yeah, I mean, you talked about it, Edgar, right? Like if now is the perfect time, right? You didn't script the first 15 plays. Well, now you got two weeks to figure it out before you go and play Washington, obviously. Uh, by the way, I know flexes can't happen until after a certain point, right? On prime time. <laughs> right. Because right. that game needs to be Sunday night football. Jaden Daniels, Kitty Williams would be an amazing watch. I just had to throw it in there. But yeah, that's the only thing there with the bye week that I think they need to work on. You hit it on the head, Edgar. I'll say I think the Bears need to focus on getting healthy. I mean, simply that yeah. get in that treatment room, get healthy. And it, it might sound silly. Like, obviously that's what the bears are going to do, but the bye week <laughs> is coming at a very good time for them. Yep. Uh, hamstrings can be tricky in the NFL. That's something that can linger. So that is going to be something worth monitoring with Kyler Gordon, Tyreek Stevenson. He was a guy who kind of popped up with an injury with a calf calf injuries can also be tricky. Yep. Now, again, the next man up thing has worked out for the bears uh, and, and Jaquan Brisker as well, right? The concussion, same thing. Concussions can be tricky. Uh, so having that extra week of recovery, I think is going to be huge because as, as I was kind of saying, the next man up thing has worked, but a 17 game season is a season of attrition. It's a war of attrition out there. You want to keep guys as healthy as possible. Uh, you know, DJ Moore got a little nicked up. He returned to the game, but he got nicked mm -hmm. up. Tevin Jenkins has been battling through a couple injuries, right? He battled through the ribs injury. He battled through the ankle. It, it, guy's a warrior fighting through that stuff. If these Ooh. guys can get healthy throughout that bye week, get a little breather, get a little, you know, extra breath. I believe they have another Thursday night football game, right? Coming up. Uh, so that'll give them kind of an extra mini buy down the road. These are important moments. These are important rest moments for the Bears. And then you guys talk about the, the need to get better starts. I think this is going to be huge for them to do self-scouting. 
This is something that Matt Eberflus's staff has been really good about over his tenure is they take these opportunities to find out what the bears are doing really well, what the bears are not doing really well, and they make adjustments. We've seen some of those adjustments already. It'll be very interesting to see what adjustments they make coming out of the break to, to rectify some of those things. I think you, you kind of nail it there too, with them being able to make adjustments on the fly. Cause I, I, going back to the um, to the, the post game uh, sound, Flu said that they're not waiting to halftime to make these adjustments, and you're kind of seeing that right where they get off to the slow start, but then the offense picks it up. The defense gets gives up a, a, a long drive to start the game or some yards on the ground to Carolina, and they shut them down later on in the game. But the, these type of uh, changes and, and coaching um, adjustments are they're not waiting to halftime. They're 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 pulling them to the side. You see them regrouping. And they're getting on the same page early, and you like to see that from 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 this team. A lot of times, we waited for in the Nagy regime, we waited to for him to make adjustments in the second half, and those never came. That that might have been just Nagy just being Nagy, but um, you are seeing those those things come game after game with this team, and um, that's a part of the offense and the defense where uh, you hope they get they fix it so they they don't have to necessarily make as many adjustments so, so they get off some better starts on both sides of the ball. But it is a breath of fresh air to see them make in-game adjustments, not wait for halftime, and you'll see the results play out on the field. All right, and then coming out of the bye, here is who the Bears have. They go on the road to the Commanders, who have been really impressive in the early stages. Then the Cardinals, a little up and down for the Arizona Cardinals. And then finally, they host the Patriots uh, that kicks off. That's that's kind of the last three games before they go through that gauntlet in the NFC North and then some other really strong teams in the NFC, including the Niners and the, the Seahawks. So three more games. We talked about it all year. Hey, the Bears have an easier start to their season. Then the gauntlet happens. They've got three games left in the quote-unquote easy portion. Kevin... What do the Bears need to do? What does their record need to be in the next three games for them to have like real playoff hopes? I got to say two and one, right? Like this has to be two and one with the expectation that, you know, you probably do beat the Patriots unless they really figure something out. Something starts clicking with Drake May uh, in their offense. You should beat them uh, and you should beat one of either the commanders or the Cardinals. Commanders look like a great team. I think they're still beatable. I think the Cardinals are also a sneaky team in the NFC, but I think they're beatable. And if what we've been saying about the Chicago Bears is true and what I said earlier about, hey, I believe that this is a legitimate playoff threat in the NFC, then you go out and you win games like that. So for me, that's the expectation is these next three games, you have to set yourself up before this division gauntlet. What we know about the NFC North right now is that it is the best division in the NFL record wise. And I think just, you know, you can kind of just take the, the, the eye test on that. They, they, it is the best division in the NFL. They had one of the undefeated teams in the Minnesota Vikings. We know the lions are going to be a threat to be uh, the representatives of the NFC and the super bowl. We know they're that good. And we know the Packers obviously are still very good with Jordan love coming back off injury uh, and all the guys that they're getting back as well. So you have to set yourself up to be in a good position. And that would put them at six and three going into that crazy NFC North gauntlet that they have really kind of an unprecedented schedule here this year with what is it? Six of those games in the final eight uh, or something crazy like that. So um, to me, it has to be two and one. I don't know about you guys, maybe one and two, but that's the expectation for me, two and one going into the, that NFC North gauntlet. Edgar, what do you think? I think they have to come out of that three and oh. I mean, I, I think there's no, I don't think there's any, I think they're, they're obviously layouts and they're like the past three games where they should beat these teams. But like, like Kevin said, they're beatable teams. Um, I know um, Jane Daniels has been, and the, and the commanders have been making noise, but I, I still think that when this, when our offense, when the Bears offense is clicking, that they should be able to, to, to get past the commanders. Um, Drake May starting for the Patriots. That Patriots team is, is not good. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think a couple, like three, what is it, three weeks before they take on the Patriots, or maybe that's the, the, the third game in that stretch, but it's still Drake. He's still a rookie quarterback. He hasn't gotten the reps in, in, in camp. He hasn't gotten the reps in the regular season. That's another game you, you should be able to take care of. Um, 
The Cardinals, like you said, are also beatable. I know you got to travel now out to Arizona for that one, but that's another team that's been up and down. Uh, Marvin Harrison, I know we're still at the time of recording this, but he he looks to be uh, struggling a bit. Like maybe he's a, a little banged up there, but. That's the only way they can get in the best position for this run down the stretch. I mean, Kevin nailed it. They're in the best division in football. Uh, the Bears are 4-2 and two at the moment after this victory, and they're still last place in their division pending the, the package results. Um, they're going to need every victory they can get, <laughs> and if they're hoping to, to squeeze some of those division, uh, those game, those some wins out of the division schedule. They're going to need these three to even compete for the division title if possible, or even the wild card. But you still got the Lions in there. The Vikings have shown that they're a for real team. That defense is is nasty on the Vikings side. Um, They're going to need every single win they get out of this stretch. I hear what you're saying, Edgar, but I think I'm with Lapka. Two and one seems reasonable with, with with that slate of games. And then that puts you at six and three. And six and three... You're feeling good. And I think if the Bears can ride that wave, they might be able to play more competitive football than if they were heading into that stretch on a losing streak, if if that mm-hmm. makes any sense. Momentum matters. I mean, we, we've yes. seen that mm-hmm. on both sides. Winning begets winning. Losing begets losing. Uh, so if the Bears can keep it up, and if they enter that stretch at 6-3, and three, I think they're, you know, they can compete with the Lions. We can, we, yeah. we've seen in the past, the Bears kind of have the Lions number. Mm-hmm. They've been able to play really competitive football against them in recent memory, even when the Lions were on that tear on those Super Bowl runs or near Super Bowl <laughs> runs, I should say. They were a few plays away from a Super Bowl. So they compete against the Lions. I think the Bears' strength in the secondary, if they get healthy, Goes against the Vikings' strength, which is Sam Darnold and Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison looking good. So, you know, I guess Jordan Addison has been hurt for for the early parts of the season. But but you can see the Bears' strengths going against some of their division foes' strengths, where if they're 6-3, and three, they, they might be riding well into the latter half of that season. So I think two wins will be, will be solid. If they go 1-2, and two, then maybe they're stumbling, bumbling a little bit into that stretch. Uh, and then I just hope that Jaden Daniels and Drake may stay healthy because how awesome are those rookie matchups going to be? We don't know really what Drake may is going to be with the Patriots, but I thought he was a really impressive quarterback prospect along with the other two guys who got all the hype. Uh, so that'll be, that will be fun to watch Drake may and Caleb Williams and then Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams. There's going to be storylines for days, uh, before we get out of here. Kevin, you've got one more note about the flex for the Commanders game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's funny because people have been talking about this, right? Because these are two of the better teams in the NFC right now, record wise. Uh, obviously, don't know what the result of the Commanders game quite yet when we're recording this, but uh, they've been a very good team. And I posted something uh, last week on, on X that's saying that Brady and Manning, that's going to be the new uh, Caleb Williams uh, and uh, Jane Daniels. Jane Daniels and Caleb Williams are going to be the new Brady and Manning there in the NFC and just go at it uh, <laughs> time, time again. And you, you get an early look at it this year. And the good news is NFL is able to flex games starting in week five in the Sunday night football weeks, five through 17, according to NBC Sports. The bad news is the Sunday night football game scheduled for week eight is Cowboys 49ers. And there is absolutely zero way the NFL is going to flex that out. Uh, so uh, we can, uh, our dreams will die there when it comes to uh, Caleb Williams versus Jane Towns in prime time. But yeah, that game is just going to be so awesome to hopefully get a glimpse at what could be uh, a true battle between those guys for the next 10, 15 years uh, in, in the NFC with how great they both look. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you to everybody for listening to this edition of the charter podcast on chsn our third victory edition of the charter on chsn uh it's been really great so we'll see you later this week we hope that because the bears played in london you got to enjoy the bears game and then you got to watch red zone or you got to watch the full slate of games enjoy the victory sunday enjoy the victory monday And we will be coming at you again this Wednesday and Friday. So uh, get used to it. Three episodes a week for the Charter Podcast. 
Once again, I'm Alex Shapiro. Thanks to Kevin and Edgar and for you for listening or for watching on YouTube, whatever it has been. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank you.